Hello everyone and welcome on our Burroughs Media Tea Time Talk channel. We are part of Interpol Young Academy and uh, today we are together for the 39th session of PAMTTT. I'm Sarah from the University of Pau and Pays de la Dour and I'm really pleased today to share this session with Mohamed from University of Oslo and uh, Federico from uh, NTNU. So today we're going to have two presentations from young researchers and uh, we really appreciate uh, audience participation in the comments. So feel free to ask questions at any time and we will share them with the speakers thereafter. So our first speaker is uh, Hong Xia Li she is uh, currently a research fellow at Calidia University and co-founder of a startup company, Micro Light Torch. She has been actively working on thermofluids, phase change, and multi-phase flow, but also micro 3D printing and novel material surface engineering. She has an impressive number of journals and publications, including uh, top journals such as uh, Nature yeah. Energy, Short, Soft Matters, and so on. And I'm really looking forward to listen to your talk. So without delay, Anthea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm also very happy to be here uh, invited by the Forest Media Tea Time Talk Committee. And I really thank you all for the great work in organizing this. So today I will talk about uh, a small part of my work since it's a Tea Time Talk. Let's make it short. And uh, I try to share some practical like experimental skills during my research. Uh, and uh, overall, it's related actually like uh, rock on chip, which is enabled by micro 3D printing and the solution based mineral coating. So, uh, yeah, as Sarah mentioned, I'm from Halifax University, and uh, actually, the 3D printing scales, like the flow imaging scales, are some uh, uh, of my PhD uh, research, and uh, some of the scales I also. Uh, obtained from uh, MIT and uh, UTSA as uh, the visiting scholar or the visiting students there. Oh, and, and by, the, by the way, today I want to uh, like take advantage of this date to share two news or to uh, 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 announcement. So one is that uh, we are uh, guest, uh, guest editing was special issue that is Women in Science for Energy Stories. So if you are interested, you are welcome to submit your abstract. And the other one is that uh, we are also to organize this International Green Energy Conference in uh, uh, Glasgow. So you are welcome to submit your abstract uh, for next year. And uh, OK, so now uh, let me come back to my uh, talk. So which uh, is today, we are all from this porous media community. And we know that the porous media, we have different type of materials like the rock is something we are familiar with. And even like in the plants, the stem, the xylem, they, they actually also is some porous uh, structures there. And uh, also uh, if you know about the wa wastewater treatment, the most common uh, technology is like the membrane filtration. The membrane is also type of the uh, 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 porous media with much, much smaller uh, like nanometer uh, poles there. So these are all uh, I try to uh, cover in my research uh, during the PhD study and now the postdoc study. But today we, uh, we will talk more about the rock uh, that is for the uh, subsurface resource utilization because I, I guess some of us we are familiar with the post scale characterization and with that we always uh, need the so-called rock on chip and the flow imaging uh, methodology 
for this type of manifest flow and all the different fluid, uh, fluid and uh, the solid surface interaction characterization. So to do this, we actually, uh, first we need a microfluidic chip uh, over there and uh, a micro, uh, like microscopy so that we can image what's happening there inside the pulse road networks. And with this uh, microfluidic chip, we can actually in inject different fluids based on our research needs. And uh, through the computer, we will get all the images and do all the anal analysis and the calculation. So, and uh, also if uh, we have uh, like even advanced uh, imaging tool, we can uh, use the confocal microscopy for the 3D imaging. Uh, that gives us an uh, overall view because all the poles, uh, like if we back to the nature, all of them are three dimension. So we uh, we can use the advanced technology uh, imaging method to get this 3D image. But uh, then again, then we need also to mimic the three dimensional uh, poles, roots, uh, like the shapes. Then that is something we can do with the micro 3D printing. So actually this work I already like published in uh, one journal paper based on the overall research methodology. But today I will just uh, focus on some, like I said, some practical uh, tips when how we can make uh, this uh, uh, rock microfluidic chip. That is how we can use the 3D printing like started from the micro uh, rock micro CT image, and uh, we use a uh, so-called micro uh, stereolithography 3D printing system. That system can help us to print uh, like uh, uh, two micrometer sized poles, and uh, then with that one, and also this is a light based uh, 3D printing method. So uh, the after printing, we can see this, the microfluid chip is actually transparent, so it can facilitate our imaging purpose. But again, this is like uh, we printed with a, a polymer resin, so it's far from the rock uh, which we want to uh, research. Then uh, we are... Uh, so to solve this problem, we, we uh, did one thing is that called mineral coating. So to do the coating is actually a, a little bit complicated uh, uh, process. Like first we need to grow the, like plant the seeds. And that is a uh, calcite nanoparticle on the surface. And with this seed, we can further grow a crystal that is mimicking our rock because our rock, if we observe the surface, is like the mineral uh, crystals. So to do this, first step is to fix this state, the nanoparticle on the uh, rock surface. And uh, again, it's inside of the microfluidic chip, it's inside the channels. That gives us some uh, difficulties to do that. But again, we can take advantage of our flooding system, the imaging system. So this now the microfluid chip can be treated as our, it's like a micro uh, chemical reactor. So we are uh, injecting with the same setup uh, with the solution cis into the microfluidic and into the channels. And also we have a special uh, uh, like the composition of this seed solution. It has, it included the IPA, which is can easily evaporate, leave the, some of the reason there. And this reason, and uh, it's, uh, how to say, we even like take advantage of the reason from the capillary ridge there. And after solidify this ridge, it's like uh, uh, it can grab this uh, nanoparticle on the surface uh, very stably there. So uh, this is also confirmed by one like uh, AFM height profile that is atomic force microscopy. So we can say this uh, nanoparticle, it's fixed on the OO surface and uh, around that there are some capillary ridge which can help 
to increase the contact surface to fix the particle on the surface. And then with that says we can further grow the crystals there. So to do that, we need to uh, immerse the whole device, that is the chip, into a water bath with 40 degrees C. And we inject uh, the saturated ion solutions there. And of course, with the temperature change, these solutions uh, uh, is getting become super saturated. And then uh, it, it started to... Uh, uh, like uh, the, to to grow on the uh, the previous the seeds we fixed there, and by controlling the growing time, uh, we can uh, control the criti uh, crystal size. Like one hour, it's around the uh, it's, the scale bar is five micrometer, so it's around one or two micron. And with two hour growth, it can go to five micron uh, or two micron like that. And when we can stop, and we uh, de that depends on which uh, type of rock surface uh, or the morphology we want to mimic. So if this is a real rock surface, we can see its crystal size. And in our community, I believe that always the surface wettability is very important in, in studying the multiphase flow. And that is also one of our purpose why we are growing the calcite crystal here because we can also uh, like uh, uh, mimic the surface wettability of the natural rock. So with all this work, uh, once we get this uh, mineral coated microfluidic chip and uh, with the uh, pulse road networks uh, where we printed, then we can continue starting our multiphase flow. Like uh, here, there is one example that is the oil recovery, uh, in mimicking the oil recovery process. We inject the water into the these uh, uh, chips, these uh, channels, and see how the oil is trapped uh, there and how much or how fast the oil is replaced out. And also we can uh, uh, like do when uh, water replacing the gas entering the, that is it's like entering the uh, empty channel. So because the mineral coating is intrinsically water wet, so we can also see uh, this uh, meniscus curvature is actually uh, uh, resulted some capillary pressure, which is helping the water entering the uh, channels. So with all these studies, we summarized uh, like the different trapping mechanism where the oil is uh, preferably trapped uh, like in on the surface or in the data and the pores or in the narrow throats. And also the percentage uh, that depends on the wettability, of course. So uh, yeah, so this type of 3D printing combined with mineral coating in fabricating the rock microfluidic chips, or even we can scale up to fabricate the whole core, like in the conventional resin characterization, they always need a one inch core. So even we can print in that big. So, and also this uh, method, we already patent it. So you are happy to, to I mean, you are welcome to use uh, this method uh, to facilitate your research, no matter is related to what, uh, if it's uh, like a rock based, then you are welcome to use, but don't use it to make money because we already have one startup, we try to yeah, commercialize this uh, type of technology. So I think today I will share this much. I, I hope you can learn something. And of course, if, if you uh, need some help in fabricating this type of rock on um, chip, then you are welcome to uh, contact me or uh, even our team here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chongfia. This was really interesting. Uh, so please, from the audience, feel free to ask questions in the comments so that we can share uh, with the speaker here. And uh, I will start with a quick question. Maybe it's a naive one, but um, with your 3D printing uh, coding strategy, means that you have 
really uh, controlling the pore size and pore uh, distribution, right? So yeah. compared so, to X-ray experiments in real rock, for instance, you you don't have problems and issues of unresolved feature, for instance, right? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Actually, from the 3D printing, it's it's we take from the real rock image. It means it's not only the porosity, the pore size, also like the pore shapes is can be exactly uh, the same with the real rock. But of yeah. course, uh, the 3D printing has the resolution limitation. Like now, we can uh, goes up to to two micron. The it means if the small uh, like a pore size below two microns, then we cannot mm. print or we cannot capture. Yeah, should be really challenging to capture behind this. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, that's true. Okay, so any question from yeah. the chat? Actually, yeah. I have one question myself. Is there any limitation with the mineral coating procedure? For example, is it easier to coat with carbonates compared to for example, coarse rich minerals compared to different clays? And what are the thicknesses that we can uh, perform with the, with the coating technique that you are using? Because it's really interesting and it's a versatile uh, method. Yeah, that is really a good question. I believe a lot of other audience might have the similar uh, like thoughts because the coating method, there are a lot of coating methods. So there are like uh, two challenges. One is that we are coating the porous media inside of the surface. It's so irregular. So there are some co some coating matter we cannot use it. And uh, for us, that's why we are using solution based. And uh, as you see, this solution based, we are to in order to grow calcite, then we have the calcium ions inside the solution. If, for example, we want to grow dolomite. Then my, uh, we might need to change to magnes um, magnesium ions. So uh, again, I think it's uh, it's what type of mineral we want to grow on the surface, and also can it be grown or not? That depends mm -hmm. on the solution, which solution we're using, and whether this solution with those ion combinations it can form the crystal there or not. So. And uh, also for the sickness, there is a risk that if our pores, like our, our channels are so narrow and we are growing it, then we might have the risk to block those uh, narrow throats. Then, they, then it means all the area behind that throat, they stopped the ion or solution supplying, then it might cause the coating is not that uniform. So there should be some sickness limit also. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So for the moment, we don't have a question from the audience. Uh, so I think uh, if Federico has no question, we can move to the second speaker. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you again, Vantia. <laughs> Okay, our second speaker uh, today is Pranay Shrestha, a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, working on the supervision of Professor Amy Bazilek at the team lab. Pranay is passionate about research and driven to advance clean energy through advanced imaging and material design. Today, he will give a talk on tomographic imaging of porous materials. Thank you, Pranay, for accep accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this, this invite and chance to talk. Um, uh, so today, as uh, Mohammed mentioned, I'll be talking about operando tomographic imaging of porous energy materials. Um, I'll, I'll go over what, what each of these terms mean in, in, in general, and um, also the, the teaser photo uh, that's, that's shown here is of, of liquid water within uh, a fuel cell, which is an energy device. Um, and hopefully that'll be clear by the end of the talk too. So um, 
yeah uh, and again if you have questions feel free to um, ask me at the end um, so in general uh, I guess I would like to preface by like what the motivation of my study is uh, clean energy materials especially electrochemical energy material energy devices like fuel cells um, or batteries or electrolyzers they're quite essential to uh, our sustainable energy infrastructure and they rely very heavily on porous materials because porous materials that are inside these devices um, have poor scale transport of reactants and products which um, essentially governs the efficiency of these devices so like a, a lot of our i guess future clean energy technology or even uh, clean energy technology that's been deployed right now relies quite heavily on on porous materials so um, I guess that's the um, big motivation of why we are interested in porous materials in energy and a sample material uh, like I've shown a sample material here where uh, it's just a, a mat of carbon fibers it's, it's a carbon fiber paper which is uh, quite thin around like 100 or 200 microns uh, in general so it's it's quite a thin layer and as you can see the 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 carbon is um, is quite heterogeneously distributed and one thing to note is like the you may notice like a sort of a coating on on top of the uh, carbon fibers and that's uh, typically in in fuel cells for example it's it's a hydrophobic uh, coating just so that um, we don't accumulate too much water um, I'll, I'll get get into the the coating details a little bit uh, further but here i just wanted to explain that uh, porous materials are quite important for energy devices and um, now i'll explain what operando tomography means so tomography just means uh, 3d imaging and a lot of times it's done using x-rays or neutrons um, and uh, tomography or 3d imaging is very relevant to porous media research because uh, we're able to resolve depending on the resolution we're able to resolve the pore structure um, of, of the porous media and it, when when we do this type of imaging during um, operation so let, let's say if when the fuel cell is running if we perform this imaging then it's called operando imaging and that's particularly um, interesting for for us uh, because it can reveal some of the complex uh, pore scale dynamics that's happening within the fuel cell while uh, during operation and um, understanding the transport dynamics is important because it lets us firstly uh, I guess uh, understand the underlying physics and then thereby optimize the transport and also the the performance of these devices um, so today uh, since this is a, sh a short talk I'll, I'll just present a sample study where we used operando tomography or 3d imaging um, to, uh, to, to basically answer one question in these energy devices. So uh, typically, as I had mentioned, the, uh, uh, these, these carbon fiber porous layers are typically coated uh, with a hydrophobic coating. And um, in most commercial materials, or I would say in all commercial materials, the, the coating is quite um, non-uniformly distributed. And, our, our, I guess, research question was, how does this non-uniform distribution um, affect the formation of water pathways in fuel cells? Water is, is quite important in fuel cells because uh, it's, it's a byproduct um, of, uh, in fuel cells. And typically, you, want, you don't want water to be clogging up the fuel cell because it essentially um, floods the fuel cell and blocks the reaction. So uh, we... we uh, we, we just don't want water to be, um, I guess, clogged up in different areas of the fuel cell. So we used 3D tomography while the fuel cell was operating to see where the water is distributed so we can learn more about um, the transport. So the method that we use to test is well, we have a fuel cell uh, that, um, uh, that that's, I guess, 
we, we measure the electro electrochemical performance. I won't I won't discuss too much about that for now and focus more on the imaging side where we used uh, 3D imaging to to look at liquid water distribution within the porous layers in the fuel cell. So the um, again, I'll focus more on the, the 3D imaging part. And um, the imaging method uh, we used was X-ray uh, tomography. And to get the X-rays, we went to a, a, a light source or a, a synchrotron, as it's called. Um, and the, the, the photo here is, is shown is uh, the Canadian light source, which is uh, in, in Canada, Saskatoon. And uh, we essentially take our equipment there, our fuel cell set up, and then uh, we get very high quality uh, x-rays that we use to image our cell. So a, the, a, a sample cell is shown um, shown on the slide. And uh, we to, to get the 3D image, we basically collect uh, around a thousand uh, or so uh, 2D images and then stitch them together. And while we're taking those uh, 1,000 or so images, we need to rotate the cell by 180 or uh, 360 degrees. Um, and then we stitch stitch it all to get a, a 3D image. Um, so once we obtain the 3D image, um, we actually perform a, a subtraction uh, where uh, the contrast between our, our like uh, carbon fibers and water is not very high. So to account for that, what we do is uh, we just we take a dry image where the, the cell is not operating, so we don't have any water produced. And we have an operando image where um, now with water production, the, the pores start filling up with water. When we just look at the operando image, it's hard to tell where the water is and where the, the fibers are. So we take a subtracted image, uh, which is shown at um, bottom bottom left, and then we um, we threshold it using uh, using some methods such as Otsu, and then we overlay it with the dry reference uh, just to see, uh, I guess, contextualize where the water is um, in, in with respect to the, the fibers and the pore space. So once we do that, we can look at the, the 3D image again. And um, I guess we see water. This is, uh, I have an exclamation point because when the first time I saw like, a 3D image with water. I was um, quite blown away. I mean, it, it it's it's been a, it's been a while, and like we've moved on to a few things, but it's still. Um, I mean, it, it it was exciting to be able to resolve such, um, um, I guess, operando processes. So here, generally, I'm, I'm like highlighted some carbon fibers, liquid water distribution, and uh, flow field. Uh, which is basically uh, part of the housing of the fuel cell. And um, I would, I would now I would like to highlight some of the, the interesting findings from, um, fr from what, we, what we saw. So um, I'll just highlight a, a couple uh, key findings that we had where uh, we found that certain, certain pores in the, in the porous layers, the GDL is just a short form for a gas diffusion layer, which is um, the, the porous media, medium of interest for us. We found that uh, certain, certain pores in, the, in that porous medium was partially rather than completely filled. So um, a lot of the, the um, modeling and design assumes, um, I guess, fully filled pores. And the, the reason for partially, partially filled pores here was uh, first the, the heterogeneous uh, pore uh, poor, poor structure and uh, mixed wettability in the GDL. We we have we found more evidence of mixed wettability where we found that um, around certain um, certain GDL or, or like uh, porous medium carbon fibers and the the channel boundaries, we found water preferentially flowed along them, and um, that gave us some evidence that mixed wettability did actually impact um, how water how water distribution is formed in the in the fuel cell and that is interesting because uh, a I guess we'll we'll be able to uh, accounting for this in models will make our like modeling predictions better 
And B, I think it gives us an opportunity to um, tailor the water transport or, or, or more effectively uh, design these porous layers so that we can actually have, um, I guess, preferential like pathways for water that's actually designed into the, into the porous medium rather than stochastically or randomly placed. So I guess this uh, was an interesting insight that um, uh, presents an interesting opportunity for future design. So in, in conclusion, um, we saw that certain, certain pores were partially rather than completely filled and liquid water preferentially flowed along some of the fibers and uh, the channel boundaries. And mixed wettability is an interesting, um, uh, I guess, parameter that we, uh, we need to account for G in GDL design and modeling. And in, in general, tomography can be extended to not just fuel cell work, but uh, to study operandal processes in a lot of different uh, porous energy materials like electrolyzers or batteries. And um, it, it, it is like a, a growing field where people are um, using x-rays and neutrons, sometimes combining them. So it's, it's, a, it's quite an exciting um, space right now. And um, I think that's that's all for me. Um, thank you, thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pranay, for this excellent presentation. I want to mention that anyone who wants to ask a question can type it in the comment section. But before that, I would like to ask a question of my own. What is the initial uh, vitality state in the um, studied fuel cell, and do you expect any? Uh, dynamics in terms of vitability change or contact angle alteration during the during the lifetime of the fuel fuel cell. Do you have any information on that? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think uh, characterizing uh, so because the the wettability is quite heterogeneous. I think truly characterizing the wettability, um, I think, requires some more like comp complex methods such as. Um, so I guess some people have done like um, like in situ injection experiments where based on how the water moves and like based on the different steps of the injection, you can calculate the distribution of like uh, contact angles. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, were, did, you, did you say something? You're muted. Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think. To truly characterize it, we would need a method like that. I mean, a lot of times right now, like people use surface, like uh, contact angle measurements, which like in my opinion are not very um, represented, representative. And um, so, so to answer that question, like I think there are some, there, there have been some recent studies where uh, the inter like the full distribution of internal wettability is characterized, but I think there is uh, more opportunity there to characterize it uh, for for a wider range of conditions like uh, initial and degradation and stuff. I think there's still um, a lack of that. But in general, if I was to guess, um, there people have reported uh, loss of uh, say say carbon and loss of some of the um, the coating during degradation. So I, I'd imagine. The, the wettability does change um, with with fuel cell operation and degradation. Great, thank you. I have another question from Hanzia, our first speaker. Uh, what is the imaging resolution and what is the smallest water droplet you can observe? Also for 3D imaging, how deep it can see? Okay, um, uh, thank you, Hanzia. Um, the so. The resolution that we we used was uh, six and a half microns per per voxel or per pixel cube, and um, the so I, I, yeah that's the that's the voxel resolution. The actual resolution is close to around like uh, ten microns or so, um, and the the imaging method we used is X-ray imaging. So we actually go through the entire sample and then um, get the information of. The, the entire sample in the in the field of view. So um, we, I, I guess it, it's a little bit different from um, confocal microscopy where um, in this, I guess, if as long as the sample 
um, does not block too much of the x-rays, we get the like um, we, we resolve basically everything in the field of view at, at the at the voxel resolution that that I stated around 10 microns. And I guess the there have there are x-ray um, x-ray sources or like configurations, um, or camera configurations that go go even lower, like uh, micron or even sub micron uh, resolution, and um, I guess it, th that is interesting for the for the dynamics. Our our, our pore sizes that uh, we were looking at um, can be resolved by around around um, I guess ten microns. There are some certain components of the GDL, or sorry, certain components of the fuel cell that are even finer that uh, you need even, I guess, lower resolution or higher resolution. So. We have another question from the audience. Gigi Giretto asks, is tomograph technique the same is used to see water in big reservoirs, for example, when they are looking for water under the rocky planet's surfaces? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Um, I'm not... Um, I'm not really sure of the the method to scan water in big reservoirs, but I believe it's not tomography because for tomography, um, you you need multiple. Because for for example, for our uh, for our uh, fuel cell, let's say we have a circular sample and we take images of the sample at um, let's say thousand different um, um, angles between like zero to one eighty. So we essentially have to rotate the fuel cell and take um, multiple different projections, as they're called, and then we stitch it back. So there is that crucial element of being able to image from multiple different angles. And um, I'm not sure if that's as easy on like a larger scale. I mean, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, to be honest, I, I'm I am not very familiar with the other methods so I, I can't really comment <laughs> maybe someone in the in the panel can yeah, comment uh, sometimes we are using geophysical techniques for example as uh, using seismic waves or using electrical waves mm -hmm. to perform uh, tomography or to perform survey on the surface to see what's deep inside the airs and maybe Gigi is referring to that one but here you were uh, explaining X-ray tomography, which is uh, performing um, uh, experiment uh, imaging using X-ray when you rotate the sample and you make projections along the sample at different angles. Okay, I think now we can wrap up this session. Thank you to our speakers for their time and the very interesting talks. We wish uh, them good luck with their future work. And hopefully we will hear more about their research uh, in the months to come. Uh, we would like to thank our audience for their support, comments, and suggestions. Please help us improve this platform for PhDs, postdocs, and young researchers working with the post media with, uh, in different topics and different applications. If you have anything interesting to share with the community and you think that post media TTT is a good platform for your research, uh, please contact us at prosmediatt at sign uh, gmail.com so we can arrange a session for your talk, for your presentation, and also you can subscribe to our mailing list if you send us an email. With this, uh, we will say goodbye and hope to see you in one month's time on October 18th. Ciao.